On February 21st, 2022, President Putin appeared on Russian national television. There he denounced the legitimacy of Ukrainian statehood, portraying the Ukrainians as nothing more than a wayward branch of the Russian people, deprived of their natural state of unification with the Russian nation. Suffice to say, this interpretation of history is a fantasy, fashioned as the spear tip of a propaganda campaign to justify naked imperialist ambition. In truth, Ukraine is the cradle of an old culture, with roots that extend farther back than any state born from Moscow. As historians, it is our job to fight authoritarians' attempts to rewrite history. So in this special video, we will examine the origins of Ukrainian culture in the ancient Kievan Rus and the Kingdom of Ruthenia, exploring the medieval roots of a storied people whose ethnogenesis began long before there were ever Tsars in Moscow. Kings and Generals is proud to announce that we've partnered with many other historical channels to create Project Ukraine, and we're grateful for their kind participation. Project Ukraine is a playlist dedicated to telling the past of the Ukrainian people to aid them in the present. Your likes, shares and donations to the charity we are collaborating with will have a direct impact in aiding the most vulnerable citizens of Ukraine. We have partnered up with the Babin Yar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kyiv, which was bombed by the Russian troops at the start of the invasion. Today, the foundation has transformed its projects, refocusing its resources and efforts on purchasing and delivering humanitarian aid to civilians and evacuating people from combat zones. In the first week of April, the center provided over 7,000 food baskets to patients and doctors at Kyiv hospitals, to bomb shelters in the Kyiv underground, as well as to people with disabilities and elderly people who cannot leave their homes. They also provided targeted assistance to 3,354 people, delivering specific medications, food and hygiene products on individual requests. We hope that viewers would consider donating to this noble cause and help with the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. The heart of modern Ukraine is the ancient Pontic steppe, upon which humans first domesticated the horse some 5,000 years ago. It is a predominantly flat grassland, whose geography has made it a highway which facilitated the endless dance of trade and war between the powers of Europe and Asia. Throughout antiquity, various tribes of different languages and cultures would make their mark on this land. The first hegemons of the steppe were the Iranian nomadic tribes of the Scythians and Sarmatians. Then, during the Age of Migrations from the late 4th century AD onwards, the land became a key waystation on the path into the Roman Empire, as the Goths and Attila's Huns both came to call the land their home as they made inroads into Western Europe. Among the many actors compelled to uproot themselves during this era were a people who, for most of antiquity, had remained invisible on the written pages of history. Likely originating along the Vistula River, the Slavs entered into the historiographic record in the 6th century AD, migrating out over a huge swath of territory stretching from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Balkan Peninsula in the south. Unlike the Scythians and Sarmatians, whose remnants they likely assimilated, the Slavs were an agricultural people who built permanent settlements. According to legend, one such settlement, established along the Dnieper River in 482 AD, was founded by a chieftain named Ki, whose name remains attached to the city he established to this day. In the 7th century AD, the idea of Ukraine, Russia and Belarus was non-existent. However, the ancestors of the men and women who made up those modern nations had been seeded across Eastern Europe as a vast quiltwork of Slavic tribes, politically disunited, but bonded through their common language, a variation of dialects known as Old East Slavic, a common ancestor of modern Ukrainian, Russian and Belarusian. In Western Europe, the Viking Age traditionally began in 793, when a gang of Norse pirates sacked a Christian monastery on the island of Lindisfarne in northern England. In Eastern Europe, it began in 860, when the Scandinavians attacked Constantinople, capital of the Roman Empire's eastern remnant, and the richest city in Europe. But how did these rugged Northmen arrive in a land so distant from their icy home? In the east, the Vikings were known as Varengians, or Rus, 
the latter derived from an archaic Swedish word meaning men who row. An apt title, for it was along the Don, Volga and Dnieper that they first appeared in Eastern Europe, seeking to use those mighty rivers as a highway to access the extremely lucrative markets of Constantinople and Baghdad. While doing this, they established a tributary relationship over many of the East Slavic tribes living along the trade rivers en route. According to the Primary Chronicle, a medieval manuscript written 300 years after the fact, in 879, a Norse chieftain named Rurik was actually invited by the Slavic tribes of the north to rule over them. Rurik duly accepted and made the city of Novgorod the capital of his hand-gifted realm. Rurik died three years later, and his impromptu domain was entrusted to his brother-in-law Helgi, who pushed its borders southward. Along the Dnieper, he encountered the old Slavic settlement founded by the eponymous Ki four centuries earlier, which was at the time ruled by another pair of Viking chieftains. Helgi seized Kiev and made it his new capital, traditionally marking the beginnings of a medieval state known as both Kievan for its capital and Rus after the longboat rowing Norsemen who founded it. We have made an exhaustive two hour long documentary on the full history of the Kievan Rus in the past, so rather than retreading old ground, let us instead discuss its pivotal role in the ethnogenesis of the modern Ukrainians. Ultimately, all three modern East Slavic nations, Ukraine, Russia and Belarus, share in the cultural legacy of Kievan Rus, not unlike how the Romance-speaking nations of Western Europe all share in the cultural legacy of ancient Rome. Moreover, defining a medieval empire using the same framework of ethnicity and identity applies to modern nation-states is inherently problematic. For example, Kievan Rus was not even an entirely Slavic realm. Its Rurikid rulers were initially Scandinavian in language and custom, and although they became increasingly Slavicized over the centuries, their realm still remained a multicultural patchwork of not just Slavs, but tribes of Finnic, Baltic, Turkic, Iranian, and other origins as well. Moreover, an erratic relationship of alternating war and trade with the Eastern Romans on the other end of the Black Sea, and the many nomadic polities riding in from their southeastern flank, added to the multi-layered culture of the Kievan Rus. With all that said, it's easy to understand why many Ukrainians today consider the Kievan Rus to be the quintessential proto-Ukrainian state, for it was during the reign of its Rurikid Grand Knezev that the pillars of modern Ukrainian identity first began manifesting into being. During the reign of Volodymyr the Great, the old Slavic and Norse pagan pantheons were abolished in favor of the god of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Volodymyr's son, Yaroslav the Wise, continued down this reformative civic path. Known as the Lawgiver, Yaroslav oversaw a Cambrian explosion of bureaucratic innovation in his realm, manufacturing widespread legal reforms and literacy programs among his people, in tandem with vast translation efforts of scripture from Byzantine Greek into the liturgical tongue of the Slavs, Old Church Slavonic, which was written in an early form of the Cyrillic alphabet still used by East Slavic nations today. Another epithet attributed to Yaroslav was the Builder, for it was under his purview that such grand monuments like the Golden Gate and St. Sophia's Cathedral were constructed in Kyiv. As a result, Kyiv became a thriving entrepot of 45,000 people that rivaled cities like London, Paris and Vienna in population, wealth and splendor. As a result, other cities in the Rus realm, like Vladimir, Polotsk and Novgorod, began developing on the model set by the gold standard of Kyiv. There is a common Ukrainian talking point that while Moscow was still a village, Kyiv was a metropolis. Clouded as this statement is in modern nationalism, it is nevertheless correct. While Moscow was mentioned in the historic record for the first time in 1147 as a minor town on the border of the Principality of Vladimir Suzdal, Kyiv was widely regarded as the mother of cities a century before that. Overall, a serious argument can be made for Kievan Rus as a cultural ethnogenesis of the Ukrainians. After all, the institutions introduced by this medieval state, especially the written alphabet and religious orthodoxy, have since evolved into core pillars of modern Ukrainian culture.
However, these cultural imprints are also seen in Belarus and Russia. Moreover, Kyiv was not the only influential urban hub in the Rus realm, with incredibly powerful cities like Novgorod, located in what is now the Russian Federation, historically challenging its influence many times over. Ultimately, Volodymyr and Yaroslav were not Ukrainian rulers, nor were they Russian rulers, they were princes of medieval Rus. In the same way that Trajan and Aurelius were not Spanish, French or Italian by their modern definitions, but emperors of Rome. With that said, just as modern Italians can reasonably claim a particular affinity to their Roman heritage, by virtue of their country being the erstwhile empire's traditional heartland, so too can Ukrainians look to the medieval empire of Volodymyr and Yaroslav and see the emergence of a distinct language and culture in their capital of Kyiv long before there was ever a Tsardom, let alone Empire of Russia. If the Golden Age of Kievan Rus seeded the beginnings of a Ukrainian identity, then its decline and fragmentation allowed for it to develop as a unique regional phenomenon separate from other East Slavic peoples. Traditionally, the heyday of the medieval Rus ended with the death of Yaroslav the Wise in 1054, after which his massive realm began slowly drifting apart into functionally autonomous regional principalities for reasons including, but not limited to, the declining of their primary trading partners in eastern Rome, the influx of Kuman Kipchak tribes in the Pontic Steppe Corridor, and the increasing frequency of dynastic power struggles and civil wars. Throughout the 12th century, the ability of Kyiv's grand princes to exert control over other Rus cities waned, and although they remained united in their orthodox faith, independent principalities began emerging throughout the formerly united Rus realm. Although potentially reductionist, it can be said that it is within these newly independent principalities that the Eastern Slavs began branching off into separate ethnic paths. Russians have traditionally seen the emerging principalities of Novgorod and Vladimir Suzdal in this era as direct precursors to the rise of Muscovy, while modern historians in Belarus look to the Principality of Polotsk for their roots. Meanwhile, the vibrant principalities of Halic and Volhynia, formerly two separate realms, united in 1199 to form the thriving domain of Galicia Volhynia, which stretched over most of what is now western Ukraine. The connective tissue of the Rus state was slowly fraying, and it is here, at this critical junction, that our favourite throat-singing kumis-drinking horse archers enter the story. For as long as Slavs had lived along the Dnieper, they had contended with the various nomadic peoples riding in along the Pontic Steppe corridor. Some, like the Khazars, had managed to dominate them, while others, like the Pechenegs and Kumen Kipchaks, were kept relatively contained. The Mongols, however, were in a league unto themselves. Batu Khan's invasion of the Rus principalities, which we covered in our previous Kievan Rus documentary, was absolutely catastrophic. Among the many urban centers devoured in its wake was Kyiv, which was burnt to the ground in November 1240. The mother of cities, already on the decline, would not recover its former prominence for centuries to come. Although calamitous in sheer death and destruction, in terms of the cultural and political continuity of the Rus principalities, the Mongol conquest represented more a political realignment than a total apocalypse. Indeed, the Mongols proved to be comparatively light rulers, demanding only regular tribute and participation in their military campaigns, and in return, allowing their subjects to live as they pleased. Under this Pax Mongolica, various Rus principalities recovered, and began to thrive once more as autonomous vassals under the loose suzerainty of the Khan. It is here our story returns to the Principality of Galicia Volhynia, whose wily prince, Danilo Romanovich, submitted himself to Mongol overlordship in 1246. Obviously this was done to spare his realm from destruction, but it was also a shrewd political move. The Mongols weren't the only big kids on the block. The Poles and Hungarians were eyeing his lands as well, and by supplicating himself to the former, he shielded himself from the aggressions of the latter. Ukraine is a word which famously means borderland, and the geopolitical plight of Danilo, whose realm was sandwiched between Mongol Khans and Catholic kings, was one of many such examples of it living up to its name. 
Far from the heartland of the Golden Horde, the Mongol presence in Galicia Volinia was very scant compared to in the northeastern Rus principalities that would later become Russia. As a result, Danilo's policies shifted westward. Seeking to free his realm from the Mongol yoke, he entered into diplomatic overtures with the Pope in Rome. In 1253, this culminated in a papal legate bestowing upon him a crown. Henceforth, Danilo was transformed from prince to king, and his realm from the Principality of Galicia Volinia to the Kingdom of Ruthenia, Ruthenia being the Latinized form of Rus, which invoked the prestige of the lost empire to whom Danilo's principality traced their heritage. Pretty much immediately after this stunt with the Pope, the Mongols rode back in and politely convinced Danilo to swear fealty back to them, but he still kept his title and his kingdom would endure for another century. The establishment of the Kingdom of Ruthenia was a watershed moment in the ethnogenesis of the Ukrainians, as it is largely considered to be the first uniquely Ukrainian nation centered primarily in Ukrainian lands. Granted, the kingdom also included lands in modern Belarus, while plenty of Poles, Germans, Hungarians and other ethnicities lived within its borders. Nevertheless, well into the 20th century, ethnic Ukrainians were primarily called Ruthenians as a direct result of this highly influential medieval kingdom, a kingdom which was established 300 years before a Tsar was crowned in Moscow. Suffice to say, the era of the Ruthenian kingdom was a critical junction in the development of the Ukrainian identity. Bereft of the ties that had once bound them to their fellow Rus cities, the East Slavs of Ruthenia, with their thriving capital in Lviv, began drifting apart from their erstwhile kinsmen in Vladimir, Novgorod and Moscow, which was just beginning to rise to prominence around this time. It was likely also during this era that old East Slavic dialects of Vladimir and Yaroslav's time began drifting into separate languages, with the common language of the Ruthenians, influenced by contact with the Poles, Crimean Tatars and others, on track to become the modern Ukrainian tongue spoke today. Another facet in which the Ruthenians drifted away from the rest of the former Rus was in their church. Despite Danilo's overtures to the Pope, Ruthenia remained a staunchly Eastern Orthodox realm. Previously, all former Rus lands were under the authority of a single metropolitanate, the Metropolitanate of All Rus, based in Kyiv. However, in 1320, the seat of this metropolitanate was moved to the rapidly growing Moscow. As a result, the Patriarch in Constantinople allowed the Ruthenians to establish their own see, the Metropolitanate of Little Rus. Centuries later, when Ukraine was absorbed into the Russian Empire, the term Little Russians was revived in a culturally imperialist context to paint the Ukrainians as nothing more than a wayward offshoot of the Russian people. However, to the medieval Greek clergyman who coined the term, little probably translated to closer or inner, and little Rus simply referred to the fact that of the two metropolitan seas in former Kievan Rus lands, the one in Halic was closer to Constantinople than the one in Moscow. The evolution of the Ukrainian identity does not end with the Kingdom of Ruthenia, but nevertheless this is where our first video on the Ukrainians will end. As we asserted before, the Ukrainians are the inheritors of an old and storied culture, one that undoubtedly shares a common root with the peoples of Belarus and the Russian Federation, but also stands apart as its own story. Long before Moscow rose to prominence, Kyiv was the mother of cities, and long before Ivan IV Vasilyevich declared himself Tsar of all Russia in Moscow, kings of Ruthenia ruled from Lviv. In our next video, the story of Ukraine will continue, as Poles and Lithuanians come to dominate the land of the Ruthenians, and a new caste of warriors, the wild and free Cossacks, continue the spirit of independence on the Ukrainian plain. So make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.